Okay, everyone. My name is Kyle Tanner. And we're going to be talking about the... I love all of you. And if you don't turn your phones off, and if you have side conversations, I won't present anything. I, I will not present anything. Okay? I need you present in the space. Is that, can we agree to do that with each other? We have a very limited amount of time um, to present hardly serious concept. So uh, I'm here to talk about the organizing spiral. This is somewhat of an esoteric way of thinking about organizing, right? So I there are schools of organizing, Midwest Academy, Acorn Style, Linsky Method, right? There are a few of these methods that have been developed over time and honed and they're taught. And it is grids and books of grids and patterns, right? I think about it a different way. Every campaign I have ever worked on is unique. Every community I have ever worked in is unique. And so for me, I think about it more as the Taoist would, right? Be formless, right? Understand your conditions. Develop a sense of the lay of the land and develop from there. What are the principles we organize around rather than a static process that we use? Does that make sense to everybody? Right? So rather than say, at six months, you um, draft your campaign plan. At four months, you finalize your campaign plan. At two months, you didn't. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a cycle of organizing. How I have experienced change as happening, right? Both historically and in my own professional experience. The organizing spiral. You can contact me, Damned Agitator, at, on Twitter, um, or DamnedAgitatorRiseUp.net if you've got questions. This is us, right? We are like in this isotope state. Isolated individuals floating around uh, the body public. As individuals, we are powerless. Absolutely powerless. My ability to make change um, is based in <laughs> is based in myth, right? The hero, right? The strong individual who rises above all odds to become a um, head of his own uh, hedge fund. Um, it's a myth. In reality, the work that we are engaged in um, requires collective discernment and collective action, right? We collectivize resources to build power, people information, and money. So this is our state, right? Isolated individuals. This is, this is how we exist most of the time. Especially us, because many of us don't have organizational homes. In other words, we're not members of the Sierra Club, right? We're not uh, perhaps in a union. You know, we don't have an institution to engage in who mediates and interprets the world and acts as a point of collectivizing power to impact public policy, right? We don't have this. And so we do our own organizing. Or we say, hey, this coal train is a bad idea. We know what's up in Montana. We have discerned with other smart and experienced people that the point of pressure to act on is Otter Creek. That's the line in the sand, right? That's where we stop this thing from happening that will have a much larger impact. So now this is us, right? Here, here are all the other isolated individuals that don't have interest in it, right? Perhaps our interest is healthcare. Perhaps our interest is playing PlayStation, right? A lot of other interests. But this becomes us, right? Once we're, once we're joined together in a collective, we stop being these little red dots isolated, and we become a cohesive unit, right? I'm not going to talk about the mechanics of getting started organizing a group. Um, there'll be some discussion of that later today. I'm going to talk about what happens after you have found people, right? So you have decided that you're going to act collectively on something. What are the principles that you can use um, as that campaign goes on and on and on? Or if you have an organization that is geared around something that is not maybe time specific, right? Not on a regulatory timeline, um, not, uh, not geared around a, an election date, right? You think, we could do this forever, and you could, right? And I'm gonna tell you exactly how you 
could do it forever and continue to build power in the process. So this is a simple system. RAR. You want to say it with me? RAR. That's so weak. But I was leading weekly. Yeah. RAR! <laughs> Research, action, reflection, reaction, reflection. This is us, right? This is our blue dot. This is where we start. This is our group. So we have decided to do something together, right? Now, there are a lot of ways to go about campaign development. Kim's pro at this. She's presenting some of this material. Um, in, a, in a broader esoteric way, this is the pattern that I have used to develop and maintain everything from Alinsky-style broad-based organizations to market campaigns for labor unions. We begin with research, right? This is the first piece, information, right? We've got to have it. So here we are, we've, we've decided to collectivize, and we engage in research. We need to know the lay of the land, right? What are we dealing with? And as equally as important, how much power do we have, right? We know what the goal is, that we're, we've collectivized around that, right? So we, 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 have this, we have this collective goal. We need to do research to determine how much power do we have, and uh, what, are, what is the lay of the land in our campaign? What are our opportunities for points of pressure where we can win, like our creek, right? That's not instinctive, right? It requires research, a knowledge of the land board, a knowledge of how land use decisions are made, right? Research is what backs that. Now, as this spiral plays out, each of these other red dots are opportunities. As Bill said yesterday, right, we're expanding alliances. Always trying to do that. The one question I am always asking when I'm working on a campaign and people suggest an action, people suggest an event, does this help us build power? Does this help us build power? Does it expand our alliances? Does it, is it going to enhance our information capacity? Is it gonna bring us more people? And is it gonna help us raise more money, right? Green power. So that question has to be answered. In the process of doing research, you're gonna meet new people, right? Because you're gonna be going out and talking to experts. You're gonna to go to the local extension, right? And learn about coal filtering water, right? And that the importance of that to uh, an aquifer and the, how no one has figured out how to reclaim an aquifer that coal has been removed from the top of, right? So there are resources and people that you'll be accessing in the community in this research process who will become part, right? So this tiny dot begins to become a spiral. And all of this is your area, right? This is this represents your power, everything inside of the spiral. So as you do research, you're reaching out to people, you're reaching out to elected officials, you know, are you gonna support this? Are you gonna vote against it, right? And you're discerning in this research process by thinking about what is the lay of the land? Do, do we have enough power, right? Or how do we get enough power? Um, and uh, you're bringing more people into your community, right, as represented by this little red dot here. Once you have a sense of the lay of the land, right, and you have a, uh, that has a, and a sense of your power and what the point of pressure is that you want to act on, right, so you, you have your strategy hashed out here, right, now it's time to start thinking about tactics, right, because you know the lay of the land, you know how much power you have, you know much, how much power you need, and you have a sense of your targets, so your strategy is set, now we can talk about tactics. Action. For me, I come, I, I'm an organizer, right? I am pretty clear that I'm not an activist, but I, um, that is as a result of me self-identifying as an organizer, right? And I don't let people off the hook when it comes to action. You have to do the hard work of organizing before you go into action. You feel me on that? Like, mm -hmm. it's hard work. It's the time consuming, knocking on doors, right? Having a thousand conversations, you know, to develop the taxonomy of a community so that you have a, have a real sense of what's going on there. And you're able to build a network and relationships with people so that you can, um, so that you can develop them into a body of strength that's willing to take a risk. People that are willing to go public and go into action together. So we have our action, right? We've decided, we've got, here's a tactic, 
You know, uh, we're going to bring people to Helena for a week, for instance. And we're going to sit in, right, as a way of putting political and social pressure on the land board, um, who are elected individuals, um, to make the right decision, right, to stop Otter Creek. We're going to demonstrate that there is a public resistance to this and that there's a, a cost to making this decision, right? Raise the risk for them. So you go into action. Immediately after every action, and this is something that everyone does, uh, um, and, one, and, and other people will talk about action plan and this sort of thing. Um, immediately after the action, you want to reflect, right? Immediately. What do we do well? You know, what can we improve? How does everybody feel? You know, very brief. This is a step that gets skipped all the time. And what ends up happening then is by the time you get around to actually having a meeting a week or two weeks <coughs> later, the, the ad hoc leaders in your group have already messaged everyone else. And so this wonderful creative uh, tableau of, of opinion and perspective and emotional response to this action you just took is washed out. And you're dealing with two or three leading people whose opinions about how the action went right. All the, all the best conversations have already been had at that point. So you want to do it right away, right? Just capture that moment. You know, and be in spirit together and share a space. Say, how do we feel? What do we do well? What can we do better? Right? Reaction. Then we move into a stage where we're assessing, right? We've taken an action. What is the response? How has the uh, lay of the land changed at this point, right? What's, what's the reaction of the target? You know, maybe the land board says, you know what we want to do? We want to bring you back and we're going to host a community meeting about Otter Creek, and we want you to come and present, right? We want the campaign, that's a win, right? Because that's the, that's the land board credentialing you as a source of reliable information for the public, right? That's a win. Um, they also might drag people out of the Capitol, um, zip-tied by their ankles and wrists, and, you know, as has happened uh, out in West Virginia recently, put some heady, you know, fines on them, you know, put some lay a half a million dollars bail on 20 people doing direct action in West Virginia. So there's a possibility of that as well, right? And that's why we, that's why we study the action planning and the roles of uh, putting on an action is because we need to have all, right, all possibilities covered when we're engaging direct action as, as a tactic. So the reaction, we're engaging the reaction. What's the reaction at this point, you know? And this is what's playing out in the media, what you're hearing through the back channels, that you have created through research, right? So as you go out, who are the interested parties so you can create these back channels of communication? <coughs> so you have what's in the public and then what's coming through in the private, right? Because oftentimes what's said in the paper is not the reality, right? It is the perception of the reality. And uh, <laughs> and those back channels will tell you what's, you know, what's really going on, those side conversations. And then reflection, pulling everyone back together for a thorough, reflection of how did the action go in depth? How did people play in their specific roles, right? Was, did jail support work, right? Well, did the food go well? Did, you know, were the, were the uh, art elements um, there on time? Were we organized? You know, did, we, did our marshals keep our march together, right? All of these pieces, you know, to help you manage the mechanics. And most importantly, how has the lay of the land changed? How is the landscape different from when you first started here, right? Always asking that. You've taken an action, there's been a reaction, and now how has the landscape changed? You've now you've drawn in three new dots, right? You've expanded your alliances, you have more power, right? If you've, uh, if you've done a good job to this point. So how has the lay of the land changed? We have more power, um, and hopefully we have created more options for ourselves, right? We've actually created more tactical options for ourselves. Your strategy is not going to change, right? Targets don't change. The 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 the, the decision making uh, doesn't change, but your tactics may change at this point, right? You're hopefully creating new opportunities for yourself, and then back to research, right? So now that we know that the lay of the land has changed, and we have our, uh, what are our current actions, right? So if it opens up new opportunities, like let's say. You go to the land board and they agree to do a comprehensive EIS that covers 
you know, a federal EIS, right? A federally mandated EIS that covers all of the states affected. That's an environmental impact statement. Thank you. Thank you. An environmental impact statement, which is obviously something that resource extractors love to avoid. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, let's say you let's say you win on that, right? Well, now suddenly there's a massive research load. How can we impact this? Right? How can we impact this? How can we, you know, what is this new timeline? Right? Here's a whole other thread that comes off of this. And in this model, what this enables you to do, right, is this. Right? So like a fractal, right? Like a little head yeah. fern. Think about it that way. <laughs> That's so crazy. Like a little head fern, right? So you come to research and say, okay, well here's this EIS track. Well, there are a lot of folks in the environmental community, um, and some of whom are, are part of this very coalition, that don't participate in direct action, that aren't overtly political, but are engaged in environmental litigation, right, support in that way, um, overt political action, right, through, you know, whatever means they're giving through, sometimes private donors, like I know in this state in particular, we have a body of some wealthy private environmental donors who give politically, they're able to swing a lot more influence maybe than the organizations. And so what this opportunity might be an offshoot, right? How do we go out and pick somebody up? Right? So this 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 EIS could sidetrack our campaign, right? Because we don't want to we don't need all of our people to be working on the EIS, right? We don't need that. We need a handful of people to be working on the EIS, doing that research, action, right? So this is coming back up here, and you've got action, reflection, right? Reaction, reflection. So we're, we, we can spin these cycles off, right, to continue to build our power and expand our area of uh, opportunity out here, right? So we don't have to move our whole body of organized people. We can take interested parties from within our organization and say, well, you know, I'm not much on public speaking. I don't like to go to things, but I am pretty good with uh, GIS mapping, right? So this is a place where they can be successful. They can be transformed, right? They can invest their skills in your campaign, in our campaigns, in a way that's both meaningful to them and transformative because they're standing up in their own way, right? It's a way of valuing and honoring all of our skills and our cultural backgrounds, right? And being, you know, allowing people to self-select. You know, that's, that is what it's all about. And this spiral continues, right? In a, in a community organizing setting, these may actually become all of these, uh, you know, this, I'm, I'm illustrating this through a campaign, but when, uh, when I would do something like this, for instance, with the IAF, you know, each of these pieces, um, you might say, okay, what we're going to do together is we are going to um, build affordable housing for undocumented workers in our community, right? Or skip affordable housing. We're going to build, um, we are going to build a human-centered housing right, for undocumented persons who are excluded from everything but maybe Catholic Charities housing in our community, and it's a need. So you may get around here to research, have an action, reflection, you know, get back around to research and realize, well, hey, wait a second, there's actually a broader need in our community, right, than just this. Or through conversation with undocumented workers, you realize, well, there are actually a whole slate of issues here. Right, they're being, they, they don't get the, the utility company won't send out bills in Spanish. And the, uh, um, and the Catholic churches that are the, where their mediated institutions aren't being responsive to them, right? They're, they're preferring their 20%, you know, reliable tithers, the white folks that um, are coming to church over the 80%, um, uh, you know, folks that are coming that are low wage agricultural workers, for instance. And, so you have suddenly new actions, right? Entirely new actions can spring off of this that are entirely independent, but were born of the original purpose, right? So the original purpose is affordable housing. And this may be well-meaning people. And once they engage in a relationship with the community, right, that they hope to serve, which 
I got my own, you know, reservations around that sort of approach to it, but that they hope to serve, they get agitated by those people, right? They're agitated and they, say, they realize, hey, there are a lot of, there are a lot more issues here, right? There's a much larger moral dynamic at work. There's more that we can do. And so people by their interest start taking on, you know, more and more of these pe pieces. You know, people say, well, geez, you know, the dreamers have got it going on, right? They're occupying Obama for America offices, you know, they're kicking down the door. They're not asking, they're telling, right? And even within the Dreamers, you have the direct action piece, right? Youth-led, like radical youth, you know, getting it done. And then at the same time, you have an entirely separate track of people who are working with someone like Marco Rubio to go out and put pressure on the Obama administration as a Republican and a darling of the, of the Republican Party in Florida to kick down the door, right? So he is changing the political calculus, as Bill would say. So they're working with him. You stand up. You be a champion on this. That's putting a massive amount of pressure on the administration and raising the cost entirely separate from the direct action that's taking place. Entirely separate from the direct action that's taking place, right? Separate, right? Separate, it, separate organizing, separate people, right? But all born of the same issue. And in fact, born of the same organization, you know, born of the same central starting point. And so this is, this works, I have found for everything, right? And as with all my organizing, it's based on the natural world, right? Feeling like we are, in fact, isolated individuals, like little isotopes out there, you know. Um, I'm not going to go into the, you know, universal prime mover is entropy and we're trying to control all that, but um, I will say that. Uh, I find that this is intuitive, and that it, um, as as a uh, as a set of principles around organizing, it allows you to maximize the tactics that are available to you. It puts the focus and the onus on the organization to constantly be doing the research, right? And and just by the nature of this spiral, you're gaining power, right? And you're assessing your power, so you always know where you're at. And you're always having that important conversation around power, around power. And what it allows you to do, I'm not sure, I unfortunately missed a, a Curtis's presentation, but last year we sat right up there in that balcony for about four and a half hours. And we talked about transformational versus transactional relationships. And when you organize on a cycle, right, it allows you to institutionalize your transactional relationships. Right, the asking for money, right, developing power through green power, you know, green power. Um, the uh, the research, right, the action. It allows you to put your organization on a cycle so that people become acculturated to it. Okay, every four months we're going to have an action, right, and we're going to spend that interim time doing research, right. Afterward, we're going to reflect, right. So people people gain confidence from it. And they begin to understand, they, and they have opportunity to play multiple roles because you're maximizing your tactical options. Does this make sense to folks? Questions? Yeah? This is a little, this is different than, well, it's actually not that different. Yeah, let me, and we were talking last night, and you also have an organizing spiral session. Yeah, we, we both realized we both have an organizing spiral <laughs> that leads into a fractal. <laughs> and we were like, what? Are you kidding me? And now um, moving on to his couch. That's right. Can I put something into reflection? Sure, please, please. please. So this may even be two minutes or something, but uh, and I'm so short, this isn't going to work. It'll work for me. It'll work for you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. We're like twins. I'm a little, I'm, I could be two twins. <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of. Okay, I can, okay, so just on, uh, so on the reflection piece, what I like people to be thinking about also is density, and I know we don't have like a whole time, a whole like thing spread out for that, but for if power equals, do you remember what I was talking about before when Curtis, when we said information plus people, plus, people money. plus money or resources. So, um, so, and then you need two of these, you know, at any given time to get the third and have power, right? So, usually these are the two we have. Would you, would you really like me to you? 
so people is in, uh, information, resources, and people. Yeah, or you could think of this as money also, but there are moral resources and economic resources. Uh, anyway, so point is, we usually are here, right? We're usually here on this one. We usually have a lot of information, and we have a lot of people, but we have very little resources, at least financial resources, right? So we need to use these two to pass the hat, right? Hey, I know about this horrible thing that's happening. I want you to be a person that's involved with it. Hey, I know about this horrible thing that's happening. I want you to help stop it. And we use our information to get more people. Once we have information of people, which come cheap, except for the time and energy and intellect it takes and passion. <laughs> um, except for that. Right, right, exactly. So then you can get the third ingredient and have power. So once you do that, the power we keep talking about here. And so something I want to just like be really clear about, when you're doing the reflection piece, mm -hmm. how can you increase the concentration of power you have where you have it? So before you're really getting here, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a thousand conversations, like Kyle said, right? So one tool that's really helpful is that just one person in your organization, just one person in your circle, can do what's called a turnout chart, right? And work with the group beforehand to say, what are the expectations uh, that we have of these people? So, I'm really just gonna sit down in a minute. Um, so, here are all the people I've talked to, right? Here are their names. Here are all the people I've talked to. Uh, they said they're coming to the action. They said they'll be there, right? I've asked them if they need a way to get there. Right? So, and I can e email everybody like an example of a good turnout chart and how it works and all that, but you know, we'll, we'll call this column Ride OK. Right? They've said, like, I know how to be there, right? At the end, you've confirmed with them three times in three different ways. You've sent Leslie to go talk to Teresa, uh, you know, because Teresa said, told you she's coming, but Leslie's the one who works with her and will know, right? You've also, like, gotten a second confirmation from her through social media or something. And you put Leslie to work because the one thing that will guarantee someone shows up is that they're getting other people to go, right? So the one way you can know for sure that someone's gonna be there is if they're doing the door knocking, they're pounding the pavement, they're doing the phone calls, they're doing the leafleting, right? If that person is doing that, that person's coming to the action, right? You have no other way of knowing for sure if a person's coming to the action. All we're talking about are like probabilities. Right, that they'll come. So if they said they'll come, they probably won't come. <laughs> right. Especially if it said maybe, maybe is a triple no. Have you heard yeah. that? Right. Yeah. Guaranteed yeah. no. Right, guaranteed no. Yeah. Three times. <laughs> it's a no, no, no. Right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Right. So, so then, if they, and then if they if they respond to an email, maybe that's another one. If they tell a coworker or a friend that they're coming, that's another one. If they start doing work. To get people there, they're coming, right? So, in the end, you want these different kinds of confirmations, right? C1, C2, C3. And then you want to put here, do I, as the organizer, in this column, this is my column right here. This is my pre-reflection column. Do I think they're coming? Do I believe it now that they'll be there? So you can build density. Right? You can build your core group and you can start holding people, those red dots, accountable right? for showing up and taking on more and more of the work. So if you're like, yes, this person's coming, definitely not coming, they gave me a maybe. <laughs> yes, they're coming, they're coming, no. Okay, when you do your reflection, you can go back, this reflection maybe is a good time to do it, I, I don't know. Um, you can go back and this column is what? So this is what, you know, What's my best guess? And I call this, you know, are they coming column. This one is did they come column. Right? Now you can compare. How good was I at turning them out? Was I able to do that? Were we able to do that as an organization? In the reflection part, the reflection is your opportunity, not just for all the other things that Kyle mentioned, but also to build the the person part of your power, right? Because this is all you've got to work with in the beginning, right? So if you want to keep building and maximize your opportunity to have those fractal points, right, expand, then maximize the play to our strengths. Let's work with the ability to really get the information out there and get the people involved.
involved. And uh, here we can be like, oh, I totally blew that one. That person did not go. Right? What happened? This is the reflection. What happened? Oh, well, you know, they told me they were coming here, uh, but they didn't respond to an email, and they gave, you know, a big fat maybe to a coworker, right? So, of course, I should have guessed that when they told me they were coming, that wasn't enough, right? I'll know better next time. Now, when you're training new people how to help with your turnout, how to help your density, you can point them to this and be like, what, how many people do you think will be there at the action? Let's work on the press release. Let's figure out what we're really going to get out of this. They'll say, they'll overestimate. They'll be like, oh, there'll be 150 people there, right? And you'll be thinking there'll be maybe 55 people there, right? Uh, and when, but that's okay. Let them go through that process. Let them go through it with you and see, um, you know, where it didn't work out. Okay, I got that one right. I got that one right. I got that one right. Uh, this person was surprised. Why did they come? And then, oh, maybe this person brought 12 people with them. That's a person of interest, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, so anyway, so for the reflection piece, I just want to add that there's probably uh, you know weeks and weeks and weeks of actually a 13 week course you could take. There are literally <laughs> weeks and weeks and weeks um, so, uh, of, of stuff like this. But that's well, that's what I think is really useful when it comes to the people part of the equation and uh, reflection. Sure, man. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. represents what I was saying earlier about the hard work of organizing, right? It's not easy. Getting to three yeses, right? It's not easy. We've got to put time in. It requires actually calling people, actually developing a relationship with a person. And for those of you who were here on the first day when I was uh, talking about honest conversations, this is one of the methods for distilling your list of potentials, right? You, Because this person brings 12 people, they just moved right to the top of my list to sit down and have a 30-minute honest conversation with. I want to know what makes that person tick. I want to know what's bringing their values in, what's in their head, right? Their heart, their loins, you know? Passion, passion, not actually losing their loins. <laughs> that happens. That happens. Yeah, you know? Don't make a practice of it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Oh yes, that's why we're respectable folk here. Uh, and, and I will also say that uh, in you know the way I organize is building teams. As I said, you know, during honest conversations, organizing through people. Right, part of transformation for me is not being in the paper, not being on the stage, right, not being the primary leader. I am developing those people. That's my team, and so. I work with my people to do this, right? This is an exercise that you can sit down with your team of three or five best leaders and say, okay, let's do this group assessment of people. Let's have a discernment right, of, of our folks so that they're developing these same skills, right? Because that should be our goal as organizers to put ourselves out of the job, right? We want to give up our skills, right? We want to develop strong leaders that can go in the field and do this for themselves. And this is, this is an excellent uh, venue for doing that, right? It's something that's neutral. Um, it's not, you're not talking about are people good, are people bad? No. Did they do what they said they were going to do? Did they turn out, right? And so it's an analytical process and developing savvy as a person engaged in the public life and, and uh, drawing other people into collective action is a necessary skill, right? And it's a good piece to sit down with people and work on because it's not subjective. It's not about valuing the individual. It's about an objective measure of the work completed. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Um, in the difference between the uh, like schedule of organizing at six months you do this and, and 10 months you do this, and, and, and the spiral model, you said that there's a difference between producing transactional or transformative relationships, yes. and I didn't exactly understand what the correlation is. So this is transactional, right? Turnout is a transactional relationship. I'm calling you to turn out. Um, I am, you know, once a year, all of our members pay dues, right? Or, um, or they have a, 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 you know, we have an annual meeting, right? We expect people to pay. 
So transactional relationships are, you know, vendor relationships. Yeah. You know, they they come to you. What do you call it? A fee for service, right? Fee for service. So it, that kind of model, right? Where people have an expectation, they're coming to you. You're providing that as an organization or as an organizer, right? It's transactional, right? Transformative is when you sit down with a group of leaders and you do this. Right? So transactional is making the turnout calls yourself and treating people as bodies on the ground. Transformational is working with a team of people to do this work, right? To make these calls and do this assessing, right? That's transformational. And so if you can, um, if you can, you know, as I say, institutionalize your transactional relationship, so put on a cycle, right? Every four months, we're going to have a fundraising event. We're going to have a fundraising house party then you don't have to spend a lot of time with them because you know it's already in the calendar, right? You have this transactional event that's going to come up where you're going to go tell people, these are our values, this is our work, give us money. And they're going to give you money. And they know every four months this house party is going to happen. And so you don't have to spend two months, you know, hand wringing and, you know, running all around and taking time away from other things to reinvent the wheel every time you want to do a fundraising event, every time you run out of money. Because you have made tra you have made that transactional relationship right part of the institutional cycle right part of your campaign cycle it's going to happen we can be prepared for it right and that means we can minimize the amount of effort we put into it which maximizes the time as an organizer you have for sitting down with your primary leaders your best folks and doing things like this right sitting down and assessing other people and thinking about and helping them to build their teams just like you're doing with them. You're my team of two to five. And, I'm, and you're giving them skills and showing them how, as an organizer, like you're, you work with the world. And, um, and then you're encouraging them to do the very same thing. Right? So they're developing their network at the same time. And it, it also frees you up to have the honest conversations that I talked about on day one. Right? Where I'm sharing with you and you're sharing with me. And we're getting to know each other and we're being enriched and growing as people in a transformational and honest way that our society doesn't present, right? Because there's, outside of maybe the New Age movement, there's not a lot of money to be made from it, you know? And I would, I would say, you know, one of, the, one of my roles of organizing is don't sell, you know? So that is a, that, that's a, that's a, you know, that's an entirely separate concept, but it maximizes the amount of time that you have as an organizer to be present in a space with people, to be affected yourself, you know, if you save an hour a week because you made something like a house party, put it on a cycle with a group of leaders, right, that are dedicated to doing that and develop competency, putting that on twice a year, then you've now saved yourself an hour a week that you can reflect. You can sit and write. You can journal. This is how the work's affecting you. There's richness in that. You know, I have, I have journals I wrote 12, 13 years ago. You know, I do it as a practice once a week. You know, sit and write. Sometimes it's a half page. Sometimes it's two words, you know? Sometimes it's three letters, FML. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's three letters, you know? But sometimes I have gone through something and it helps to put it on paper, right? And it's so valuable to go back and look at it later. And it provides me with a narrative base so when I go out and organize, right, I'm transferring my private, you know, my private transformation to public story. And that helps me be more, um, that helps me develop deeper relationships with well. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. <clears throat> My name is John. I have a comment and a question. Yes. I just want to thank you for laying this out. I never thought this would be just laid out in like form of an equation. I can totally relate to um, the probability of the dice roll in terms of turning people out to an event. Um, I also want to comment on the importance of the, the, the issue itself and the messaging around it. So I mean, if the mess, if the issue itself hits a nerve with the people out there, it hits a need for people out there, then it could spread like wildfire itself in terms of word of mouth. And these are things that you can totally control up here, but there's also the aspect of what you can't control out there. Um, and so I just want to touch on the importance of messaging and the research component that you began with um, in this in this RAR um, equation. <laughs> RAR. But, yeah, and you know John Sellers will be over tomorrow. Um, who's Gray beard, you know, old hat at it, and he'll be talking about messaging. And in our, uh, yeah, that's what my dad's expected. He always had a gray beard, it's just funny. Um, <laughs> and and, uh, and 
today we'll be talking about in our earned media session, right, some of those same things. Um, but I, I absolutely agree, right, messaging is, is very important. And, and, you know, that's part of your research, right? When you know the lay of the land, you know, part of that might be, you know, one of the things I encourage people to do is do your own polling. Right, I, used to, I started a polling firm a couple of years ago and taught myself enough asterisks to put up a, you know, an IVR polling system. It's really cheap, really cheap to do your own polling. You can do beautiful 17 question instant voice response polls for like 350 bucks. You know, 650 respondents, three and a half, four percent error rate. You know, you're not necessarily putting them out to the press, but then you know, right? It's a technical tool that is within our grasp now that never was before. You know, you don't have to pay 35 grand or five grand for a poll, you know. Um, it's not live calling, but that's, we could talk about that. <laughs> we could talk about the variable values of polls, right, later, but that is, um, uh, so, so that is, uh, you know, that's a place where, you know, as a research component, that, that's what reveals your message, right? You've got your strategy and then your message based on, you know, associated with the tactic, you got your campaign message, et cetera. The research is gonna unearth that, right? You, you've got to, that's something that will come out of this, this combination of conversations, power assessment, and understanding the label. Yes? Um, yeah, one thing I, I mean, and it's kind of encapsulated in what you're saying here, but uh, in my experience, uh, adaptability is, is a huge deal. Because uh, one thing that comes specifically to mind is uh, back when I was in college, there was a movement to bring awareness to functional literacy in the city of Chicago mm -hmm. and to try to put pressure to create more resources to help adults who had come through our public school system with you know, a shoddy education and could barely fill out job applications. So the plan was first we create a literacy center and you know start around that, bringing the resource to the community. Well, just about everybody who showed up um, originally was ESL. It was the immigrant community that needed to be tutored in how to speak and write English. So it's like, well, these are the people who are showing up, and we want this place to thrive. So we brought in as many Spanish speakers as possible, and then people like me who studied French wound up working with the more advanced students who what they needed was to talk to someone who was going to force them to communicate in English the whole time. And in that way, word of mouth spread around the city. It's like this is the only free one-on-one -on -one ESL tutoring, you know, facility in the city of Chicago. And when you do something that like that, that's groundbreaking, it's like people notice. And so it's uh, because of the adaptability of it, it took off and succeeded, and is still a functioning program almost 10 years later. But uh, yeah, if we hadn't been able to just keep changing things around such that it actually fit the community, it would have died within the first six months. That's a, that, that is a, not only really is an awesome effort, but it's a good story. And I would say that that's, right, that, that's what this is all about. You know, when you're, when you're uh, reflecting, right, you're not just reflecting on, you know, specifically how did our action go, but how is it affecting us? And so it begins to reveal this narrative of, well, I've been, you know, I've been teaching these ESL classes and what, you know, I'm getting more people that I can handle. Well, why is that, right? And then you begin, and then that gives you the opportunity to do research, right? And so you say, okay, well, what are the, what are the opportunities here? You know, how do we engage folks that learn French, right? You know, but, but have a heart for it, right? And it will be good at it. And so you, that, that is, uh, that is entirely accounted for in this model. And that's one of the things that I value about it as a as a set of principles is that it is flexible. Because situations change, the political calculus changes, um, your resources change, you know? I, had, I was once in an organization where we were uh, sued by the um, Evergreen Freedom Foundation uh, in an uh, attempt to intimidate us into stopping what we were doing. And the result was that um, two major environmental owners in the Northwest wrote gigantic checks. Immediately, they're like, "I'm going to help you fight this." Like those guys are bad guys. I'm going to. They wrote huge checks. Well, so suddenly we went from having, you know, literally no money, to having a half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Right. So a ton of money. Now we could have hired a social media consultants. And, you know, a lot of people. You know, gone out and paid the PPP twelve grand to do a nice IBR poll and. But instead, we did that work ourselves, right? And we sat down. We said, "Okay, now everything's changed, right? The the our strategy, 
right, was entirely informed by the amount of green power that we had, right? Our strategy was uh, entirely informed by that, and so how does this change? And so, so we actually wiped this away and started again. Said, okay, now we have these resources. We're able to bring in some professional capacity, right? We're able to bring in, uh, able to, to do some research, right? More people were brought to the table because we got, you know, more allies once, once we showed up as an organization with some resources. And, uh, and so we just wiped this and started again, right, from this point. Said, okay, who's with us now? And of course, you know, a lot more people are with us. <laughs> like, hell yeah! You know, now we can pay for buses and we can get good lockdown devices. And, you know, we can do all these things. And so, um, so there are moments like that to transform everything. Yes? How many people are involved in this when you're starting out? Two or more. Yep. Mm -hmm. Two or more. Two or more. Yeah. Yeah. You are not a group. No, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we can do things. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I can't, you know, I can't, uh, um, many of us can't carry someone, but right, if two of us stand here like this, we can carry folks all day long. You know, we can carry much heavier weight as two people than one. You know, obviously, the metaphor for this is that's what you need, two or more people. Any two or more people. I prefer smaller team sizes. I like to organize through people, as I say. I think it's a good practice because it keeps the heat on people, keeps the focus on them to continue developing, keeps my batteries charged as an organizer because I feel like I'm giving it up. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not jealously guarding, you know, what little I know about this. I'm trying to give it all away, you know, because <laughs> I've been lucky to develop, uh, to, to just work with good people. You know, and develop uh, and and benefit from the wisdom, and so I want that to, to go out to the broader community, so that everyone can, you know, at least assess this as a possible methodology for thinking about their campaigns and being as successful as I've been lucky to be in my work with it. And I want to do time check, right? And it is 11:03, so I am going to, if we can be brief. So I just wanted to know why after reflection. It's not just action, which is tailored to, towards that reflection. Why is reaction? Well, because for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And uh, we are not separate from the natural world. We are governed by the natural world. right? So in the same way, um, if, I, if I say to Ahern, you know, you're an asshole. <laughs> and I, I don't appreciate you sitting in here in front of my session, <laughs> smiling and nodding. Like, <laughs> right? So if I pull him out publicly, right, in, in, in that way, right, I'm, I'm taking an action, right, I'm, I'm, I'm taking an, a, a forward action, then there's going to be a reaction, right? There is, <laughs> there is going to be a reaction, you know? You can expect that. There's always a reaction, right? There's always a Oh, reflection. Thank you. I didn't really, it didn't show up. I did. Anyway, oh, I think sorry. I know what Roy is saying is that, um, so what, 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 what he's saying is that right after the action you do, you all like get together right away and you do the little R reflection. You're like, how'd that go? Let's check in. Blah, 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 right? But you can expect the next day or something that there will be a reaction to the thing you just did at the governor's office or oh, whatever. Okay. And then you do your big reflection to see where you're at and who showed up and where it got you. Oh, whether, oh. So that's what, there's, so so there's a little react, a little R reflection and then okay. the reaction the from your from action. Reaction from your own group, reaction yeah. from the society, yes, and right. then reflection again to combine all of that that's to right. rearrange your action. I like to think about it in this way, smaller reflection we have right after, that's about who we are. How are we affected, right? Big R reflection, how does this affect the campaign, right? What we do. Okay. So who we are, what we now do. I got it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And thank you. Well, I want to be mindful of the fact that we ran over a little bit this morning. And so I want to cut it uh, now so that folks have a chance to get a cup of coffee or something and, and make it to the next session in time. Um, any final questions? Yeah.
Please, you know, like we're, I'll be, I'm usually by the fire until like four in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> what he's saying is he needs somebody around four to drag him out <laughs> from the fire. And yeah, that's right. Please, please show up at two and say, listen, let's talk for 20 minutes and then go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know? Who's, where's my buddy? Where's my buddy? Okay. Where you at, brother? Where you at? You know, you're playing guitar, missing sessions. I'm staying up all night. Um. This is what we talked about earlier. This is me. <laughs> Feel free to hit me up, right? I'll be here until Thursday evening as well after dinner. And uh, together, together. That's what it is. We don't. We can't do anything alone. Can't do anything alone. Then we're just alone, and that's no good. It's no good for the spirit, right? We're not making change. Again. Yeah, that's what matters. Where do you, uh, where are you from? You do all your activities. An island south of here. What is it called? Uh, a Hearsty Island. Is that on the live stream? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll catch up with you. Maybe we got a little glitch here for a second. I'm not necessarily interested in telling the world where I live. <laughs> Although you gotta, you got to open a gate and drive up my driveway, so good luck with that. <laughs> I will hear you coming, live stream. <laughs>